Hi, I'm James Barron, and I'd like to welcome Barry Schwabsky to our Zoom today on Moira Dreyer. Barry writes for The Nation and for Art Forum. He has two fabulous new books of poetry. So he kind of wears two hats. Um, in addition to being one of my favorite art critics, he is absolutely one of the best art writers and critics. He keeps it sincere. And I think it's fair to say there are people in the art world who have never really had a spiritual experience with artwork, but Barry has, and his writing is always close to the bone with that in mind. So Barry, welcome. Thanks, thanks so much, James, for having me here. And I was just remembering actually that the reason that we even know each other is because of Moira Dreyer. When I kind of stumbled into a sort of pop-up space that you had, I think it was on Rivington Street uh, right. some years ago, and you had uh, a kind of group show and there was uh, something of Moira's there. And that drew me to get you into conversation about, oh, what's this doing here? And, and why is it here? And so on. And I, I knew her and we had that whole a conversation then that really bloomed into a friendship. It was kind of incredible because when you came in, uh, I just felt like we were locked in immediately with this fabulous artist who at that moment in 2011 was still not gaining the recognition that she deserved. Tragically, she died at age 34 of cancer. Um, Ironically, she's in a show with Laura de Santillana at our gallery right now, an artist who died of cancer at age 64. And in our lower gallery behind me is a show of Dawn Clements, who also died of cancer at age 61. So, but we lost a great one. She was really a quirky, unusual artist. Um, my wife, Jeanette, did a portrait of her for Vanity Fair way back in the day. And I was so envious that she was going down to the studio because I never got there. How did you first come in contact with Moira's work? Well, let's see. Her um, first gallery in New York was the John Good Gallery. And I had, uh, I was quite interested in that gallery's program in the late uh, 80s when uh, John was showing uh, a lot of really interesting young abstract painters that I thought were giving a new new currency to to abstraction at a moment when it had been a little bit um, sidelined, you know, because in the you can you know to have this kind of rough and kind of stupid periodization, but it's hard to avoid. You can say that in the early eighties you had the uh, neo expressionist onslaught, uh, you know, uh, people like Julian Schnabel and uh, uh, Francesco Clemente and uh, Ansel Kiefer, you know, people all over, uh, Georg Boslitz, uh, all over both the U.S. and uh, Europe, uh, a new wave of figurative expressionist painting. And then that was kind of closely followed by uh, Neo Geo and uh, which is actually a very disparate group of people that goes from Peter Halley to Jeff Koons to Chaim Steinbeck. Um, uh, at that time, Ashley Bickerton, who then went into a different direction and so on, uh, who were doing kind of much cooler art that was uh, more about commodity culture. And it was a sort of uh, meld of minimalism and pop in a certain way. Uh, Halley aside, they were mostly not painters. He was really the only prominent uh, painter in the group. And so with those uh, being the two previous fashionable waves in New York uh, and, and beyond, um, you could say that what Moira was, was Moira was up to and some of the other artists that John Good were, was showing at the time uh, were a sort of fresh and surprising development. And uh, yeah, and I paid particular attention to Moira's work and, and got to know her a little bit. We had a, a you know, uh, luckily I did get to go to her studio uh, a couple of times over the years. And, and have those kind of conversations. What was she like? She was uh, 
her appearance was extremely uh, elegant, I would say. Uh, there was this kind of uh, almost Catherine Hepburn aspect to her. I think even uh, Ross Blechner, Ross Blechner that. made yeah. that comparison before. I was, I'm stealing from Ross, but you know, he's a pretty perceptive guy. He was right. Um, slightly, um, you know, slightly reserved in that, let's say, Canadian way or what we Americans uh, uh, sort of stereotype as a, as a Canadian way. Um, and just, you know, you know, super, super intelligent. You know, her, her conversation was very sharp. Well, we're looking here at the first slide, which is um, a picture of our upper gallery. And you could see a uh, culture shock, which is a painting that um, actually was exhibited by Mary Boone in the center. Off to the right, you see EKG on the left. You can barely see it, a smaller painting, the sort of a Harlequin pattern. And then the three glass sculptures are by Laura de Santiana, who lived on the Judaica and worked in Murano. Um, actually, Hasey Cross, one of our gallery directors, came up with the idea of pairing the two. And I thought it really held a lot of water. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look at these works um, because they refer to certain art such as the thinness reminded me of Morris Lewis, kind of the grit that you feel in the veils. But she was very attracted to early Italian art, early Italian Renaissance art. And um, the influence, you can kind of see it also in Solowit with his wall drawings. You know, the idea of take away the figures and what do you have behind it? Yeah. Sometimes I think like Robert Mangold is very interested in that kind of thing as well, by the way. Yeah. Let's look at the next slide, please. So Elizabeth Murray, do you want to talk about this uh, relationship a bit? Well, I don't know that much about it. I know that uh, Moira was Elizabeth's uh, studio assistant at a certain point, uh, but I but never, I never asked her about their relationship or or anything like that. School of Visual Arts, they studied together, but there is sort well, of no, no. She was the yeah, Elizabeth was the teacher, and yeah, Moira was the student. The student, exactly. But it's very interesting because there is something like a quirky relationship between the two. We've got this work called Big Mother, which was at the show at um, on Rivington Street with a kickstand. And there's kind of a postmodern aspect that I think that she shares with Elizabeth. But the, you know, yes, of course, there, there's something shared, but you can see that with Elizabeth, the uh, sort of feeling tone of the work is much more kind of boisterous and uproarious and with uh, Moira it's more reserved and they both uh, sort of broke uh, the unity of the rectangular uh, tableau uh, but um, Elizabeth did it by kind of going out in all directions and Moira made much more discreet and uh, specific uh, additions to to the rectangle. Often she would juxtapose a little a little rectangle to the main one or but there there were other kinds of additions as well. Or have a painting rest on a tree stump or have um, the handle of a handbag, things like that. The next yeah, slide. she was so specific about these uh, little details. And that's something uh, that I kind of relate as well to uh, Robert Ryman and how he used to think so much about like uh, what kind of screw is going to attach this surface to uh, a hinge that will then attach it to the wall. And that became one of his painting decisions. Uh, it wasn't just about how he was going to you know, put the uh, the paint on the surface, but then how that surface is going to relate to the wall and to its kind of total 
environment. And I think uh, that's a very important uh, precursor for Moira. I think that's a super interesting comparison, one which I had never thought of. Um, this is a portrait which Jeanette took. This was for Vanity Fair in 1989. And you could see the cutout in one of her paintings. So she worked yeah. often on ordinary plywood. And this cutout appears almost like, you know, the cutout in a violin or a cello. Um, it's so interesting that she yeah. was able to- Which, which well, to me, by the way, uh, uh, maybe, this is a, maybe this is an arbitrary association, but uh, it relates to that famous photograph of Man Ray that's called uh, Violon Danga, uh, where he puts two of these uh, kind of violin sound holes uh, onto the back of a woman uh, nude whom, whom he's photographed. Yeah, it's very interesting because I remember when Jeanette went to take this picture, first she met Moira and they had a conversation and then she went back and she said something was different. And what was different was that she hadn't known that Moira had been in chemotherapy and that this, I believe was a wig. And- um, Yeah, it looks, like, it looks like a wig actually. I yeah. was thinking oh, her hair looks really strange in this. Um, and you see how she incorporated this journey with cancer into her work. We'll see it later on with a painting called EKG, which we all know yeah. is, you know, the um, the scan we see for a heart. Yeah. And there are times later on where it's almost like the cellular structure is expressed in the painting. Yeah. I just love this picture. Um, the, the flair, the knowingness, um, obviously she was an extremely beautiful woman. Um, the assuredness, and I love how she's holding the back of the chair. It's just like almost like a steering on a boat or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Next slide, please. Now here's Culture Shock from 1990. This is 46 Beautiful. by 48 inches, normal plywood. They sit, for those who haven't seen the paintings, about two or three inches off the wall. They have a support in the back. And she was using Cassine paint. Do you know much about that paint, Barry? Well, it's a very old uh, type of paint, and it's uh, it's um, you know it has a very particular uh, matte texture, and I'm I'm kind of interest in the fact that she used it on these uh, plywood boards, which apparently were not um, primed because you, you always see through to the grain of the wood. Uh, and so I imagine that even though these paintings are very, uh, the paint looks very thin on them, despite the fact that there's a kind of density of effect, um, she must have used a lot of paint because I think that a lot of the paint must have actually sunk into the wood. Uh, so there's a kind of uh, paradox there that she must have used a good bit of material in order to make something that would have uh, uh, a surface that had a certain a kind of transparency so that you could see through to the uh, to the wood grain that was beneath. They have almost a powdery feel as though it's yes. gunpowder. Um, I love how this painting feels almost like you're looking at water in the early morning or at dusk, and it's got just some sort of ripple. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny how it expands almost from two thirds away from the right hand side and seems to expand from that point. Um, you know, we were talking about spiritual. I think it'd be very hard to look at this painting, really spend time with it, and not have something of a spiritual experience from it. Or at least I'm speaking from my own experience. But look how she's striding different colors. And um, I can only imagine what it was like to use her arm and kind of move across the picture surface. Um, does it almost seem to have a horizon line to you, Barry? Yeah, yeah, I think you could say that because the top, like maybe half dozen 
stripes are much straighter and also they're they're lighter in tone than what's beneath them so it is as though you have these kind of rolling waves and then in the background uh a sky but it's uh you know of course it's not uh, a definite depiction it's just yeah. it's just an implication and then i think in a certain way uh you talk about spiritual aspect i would i would just put it a little differently i would just say meditative it it, it, it inculcates a kind of meditative mood and i think as you go more and more deeply into that mood that uh distinction between the upper band and the rest somehow for me becomes less dramatic it it becomes more uh more of a piece and you you start to feel that all these waves that are further down are really just a kind of amplification of of slight differences that are in the more, seemingly more still uh horizontal uh brush strokes that are are at the top we had a very interesting visit um in 2011 first lily siegel came to see the show and she then became the curator of the show at the phillips and at the reston in dc a show which really unfortunately was seen by very few people because it was at the absolute epitome of the worst moment in covid yeah, yeah. Um, but they they were talking about the mathematical um element in their family and it's a history of mathematicians. Hmm. Apparently, they'd been at a canal. I don't believe it was the Panama Canal, but they were watching what they called a standing wave. That is a wave that kept its peak as it was moving down the canal. And they were so intrigued that they wrote the mathematical formula for that. And I was thinking how interesting it is that then Moira spends an awful lot of time doing paintings that look like mysterious waves that have motion, but they don't have motion. Well, it's also interesting to me because if you look at some other paintings of hers, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you have any of these in, in your slideshow, but uh, there are certain paintings of hers where these wave-like forms with uh, sort of turn in on themselves and they become the whorls of a fingerprint and so it becomes yeah. a sort of yeah. emblem of emblem of identity, uh, but it's a kind of anonymous identity, of course, because it's not anybody's fingerprint in particular. It's 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 just the idea of a fingerprint. Next slide, please. We do have some of those, fortunately. Whoops. Uh, could you go back to the quote by Peter? You know, she really was a painter's painter. You know, I suppose that's an expression that's used for people, artists who consistently create paintings that are admired by artists, but don't break through in the commercial art world. They don't make it into an evening sale at a major auction house. But I think it's really interesting that people like Peter Sheljal and, uh, you and I and other people spend a lot of time really thinking about these paintings. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I think that also has something to do with her early death. Uh, she was, you know, she was quite successful in her brief life. And uh, of course, after she showed with the John Good Gallery, she showed with Mary Boone, which was kind of the premier venue at, at the time and people took a lot of notice uh and i think if things had gone another way and if she were still with us today as a woman in her 60s we'd see an extraordinarily successful person uh who who might be known in those wider circles uh you know, but the fact is that in the end, she didn't she didn't get to make that many works. And uh, 
she wasn't there to kind of pursue uh, that kind of worldly success. So uh, uh, things became a little bit quiet after her death, but, you know, uh, people who had seen her work uh, never forgot it. They remained emotionally attached to it and uh, uh, like us still are today. And I think also younger, younger painters who came up somehow kept hearing about her as an almost a rumor and she she has had all along a kind of uh i guess the word is cult among uh certain younger painters who by now of course are mid-career painters and so on who uh who had the idea that her work pointed out openings and new directions and possibilities that can still be explored. Next slide, please. This just detail to give those who haven't seen a painting an idea of what they look like from the side. You see the wood support mm -hmm. and then the plywood. Um, there seems to be some sort of layer of white underneath all the paint. And then to the right, a feeling of the drip, which um, reminds me so much of Morris Lewis veils in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I think because the wood surface is so different from the canvas that he used, it's uh, it's a different feeling, and this this, as you say, is one where it seems like she did prime the surface first. And so uh, I think if we, when when we're looking at that closer up shot from the edge, you can't see the uh, wood grain the way you can in many of her other paintings. So it's a slightly uh, different surface than some of the others, but. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a there's there's a real oomph to to how the paint sits there with itself. That's for me is very different than uh, the lyricism of Morris Lewis. Next slide, please. So this uh, is EKG from 1988, 48 by 48 inches. This is one that was included in Lily Siegel's show at the Phillips. And you actually can see, especially in the upper portion of the picture, the bare unprimed plywood coming through as this kind of tawny yellow. Um, Barry, do you want to talk a little bit about the edges? She's got in this painting, the green on the left and the right with this straight edge coming straight down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of those framing devices that she often used, as I mentioned before, sometimes they were things that were physically added around the edge of the um, of the square or the rectangle. You know, they could have scalloped edges or uh, so on. But in this case, it's just, uh, yeah, just these, almost like a kind of bracketing of the, the central image. Uh, I, I also just want to point out that this this blue green palette that you see here is something that you see in a lot of her paintings. It's something that she went back to over and over again, and it's uh, you know I think it reflects the you know the cool colors, the cool portion of the spectrum reflects her kind of cool emotionality in 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 the work. I'd like to point out also, there's a dark line that you see on the right edge, about one quarter of the way down, going right to the middle. That's a crack in the plywood. So she went with it. She didn't fill it in with gesso or something. And that's something that she liked to do is let the wood itself speak without being altered. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please.
it is so interesting to take a cardiogram and to turn it into art. It's a very personal thing for anybody who has uh, either gone through um, you know, radiation and chemo or known someone who has. Um, well, here, I think we have to bring in a fact uh, of her kind of backstory, which is, uh, you know, before she ever became ill herself, she was a very, uh, you know, I mean, deeply acquainted with, uh, uh, with things like this, because uh, when she was a student, uh, she met a fellow young painter uh, whom she married. And then 18 months after their marriage, he suddenly died still in his 20s of a congenital heart ailment. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think there was a kind of poignancy to her life all along. And of course, the the idea of the EKG may relate back to uh, to that fact. Absolutely. Next slide, please. This is a detail to give those who haven't seen one in person kind of this um, feeling of looking at the painting. You want to get very close to it. I think there's also this feeling that you almost want to touch it because of the granular surface. Of course, you can't. Um, they're somewhat fragile. Uh, and then you step back and you have a whole different view. You can see this um, expanding concentric grain in the left just underneath the middle of the picture. Again, that's in the plywood. Next slide, please. Also, just to, to point out in, in that or any of these, uh, the peculiar, not exactly contradiction, but let's say tension between the fact that uh, the paint looks so flowing and you know you have these images that remind you of waves and of all kinds of liquid things, which of course is the state that the, you know, the paint started out in uh, when she applied it to the, uh, the plywood uh, surface. But then the, the actual texture, as you pointed out, is so uh, dry looking and so, um, yes, powdery. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a funny kind of implicit contrast between the fluidity and the dryness in her work, which I think also is metaphorically resonant. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Just another view in the exhibition. Um, next, please. So this is a view of the exhibition that brought us together, which is at um, Rivington Street. So there was our, uh, two Rebecca Warrens on the left, a Lee Krasner, which was very interesting as a pastel. And the pastel left that powdery residue in the middle is uh, a sculpture by Ruth Duckworth. And then to the right is EKG. Next slide, please. Quote by Ross Blechner. He was really taken by her work. I did an interview with him for that pop-up in 2011. And um, he spoke in such beautiful sentences it barely needed to be edited. Um, she liked washed away color, color between color. Wow. You were talking about Mangold. There's an artist who I think about color between color. Mm -hmm. Although, well, you know, his color is very, I mean, whatever he uses, whatever color he uses is quite declared, that color. I think when uh, Ross talks about color between color in relation to Moira's work, I think he's talking about the fact that it always seems to be shifting and uh, one color melting into another. And it's a little bit, um, uh, you know, there's a kind of transient effect. You can't quite grab hold for very long of one particular color. It's already, already sort of turning into another shade. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. 
So this, this is, is what this is an amazing piece. Uh, yeah, I'll never forget this. Staggering. And it's on view at MoMA right now. Mm, great. 87 NBC Nightly News, which is also a hell of a title for those of us who grew up with the news on as we ate our dinner with our family. <laughs> um, so to give you an idea of the scale, it's 86 by 42 and it stands 48 inches deep. Um, so do you want to talk about this one? I mean, what strikes you as being so unique about it, Barry? Well, there's so many things, but of course, the the, the first one above all is the fact that uh, the painting surface is not flat, but it's also literally wrenched out of its possible flatness and, and held into uh, this curved, uh, almost tent-like form by uh, a metal, um, you know, a metal piece that holds it together at the top, uh, so that there's really uh, a sense that uh, it's being really, in a way, forced out of its natural state into an, another one that she's determined that it's got to have. And yet, um, and yet you can't forget that, you know, after all, it is a, sh a thin sheet of, uh, here it says wood, but I think it, again, it's probably plywood. I'm not sure. Maybe it's, maybe it's just wood. Um, and and that probably when she started working on it, it was flat. Um, there's a funny thing where uh, maybe this is delving too too deeply into the inner history of art criticism, but uh, there was a piece that Michael Fried wrote about some sculptures that Jules Zelitsky had made. And they were, I think, made of canvas that was rolled you know, rolled up, had been painted and then rolled. And then Fried said, uh, it's amazing because it's it's flat, but it's rolled. And then Robert Smithson wrote something making fun of Fried. And he thought this was like the biggest joke to be impressed by something being flat, but rolled. Uh, anyway, this isn't quite rolled, but it's it's rolling. And and uh, it's almost as if she's uh, measuring the meaning of both uh, Smithson's and Freed's uh, views of, of what can be said about a, a painting and maybe allowing for them both. It's funny because obviously you're a poet. I think there's beyond the formal aspect of her work, something very poetic where I feel almost like I'm looking at a flame on the inside of a cave or the inside of my hand or the inside of a tent where she's done this very clever thing to give us this convex shape and the feeling of this light kind of emanating from beneath. I find it incredibly poetic. Yeah. Next slide, please. Different views of it. For those who have not seen it, you know, I would really try to get to MoMA. Um, it was in a show that they curated after her death, sort of a memorial show in one of the um, project rooms. And it's up again now. I think there's always like an effort in the art world for us to resurrect these people who died tragically at age 34 or who had been forgotten. Um, but I'm very glad that this is back on view. Next slide, please. So here from 93, um, this is a show curated, organized by Robert Storr, black and white photos, which obviously don't express that much, but you do see how she keeps playing with different forms. The one in the middle, um, it's hard to read it in black and white. Next slide, please. These are the instructions which are on the back, uh, which on the back of this piece called Big Mother from 88. This piece I believe was included in one of the John Good shows, um, but it's just so touching the way she figures this out. So point A is on the left and it's got a grommet 
point B is on the right and it's got a kickstand. So one point A is 10 inches off the wall, point B is 24 inches. And you know, the blue black is face out. It's got this orange back, which glows. So it's like when it's lit, you can see on the left, the picture of the glow from the Verso. Again, that's, that's such an expression of uh, the fact that the, the you know, it, the, there's a kind of intensity that is somewhat veiled always in her work. And yet it's, it makes itself present here in a very literal way through the intensity of the uh, paint on the back of the piece showing itself in the reflection that you see around the the edges of this, you know, kind of quite undemonstrative seeming uh, gr dark gray uh, front, although it has this funny kind of scallop thing at the curtain, like maybe in a way, or uh, like they're in sweat, as if they were swags uh, hanging across the top. So there's also a, a, a humor there, but, um, but, you know, it's a bit, the, front part is a bit close to the chest and then the back is more blatant you could say it's funny because the way it leans it reminds me a little bit of richard sarah obviously it's not you know intended to be a, a reference to richard sarah um i also love how she you know always handle peace with white cotton gloves you know she's all really looking out for how it's going to be cared for unfold foot from transport and locked down for installation. I love how it's kind of like boom, you know, uh, with the arrow. Next, please. Uh, none of the element of Richard Sarah's work. It's interesting this to uh, talk about the the theatrical situation that that goes back to the Michael Fried reference to you know his criticism of minimalist art as being theatrical. Uh, she takes on that theatricality as a po positive attribute, and also that she'd work for Malibu Mines. You know that's right. Yeah, she 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 done uh, yeah that is a day job early on to. Uh, work on, I don't know exactly what, on making sets and, and props. <laughs> uh, people in, in, in the, uh, uh, just to put it out, I mean, in a lot of things that are written about her, it's said that she was, a de that she designed for them. But actually, if you look through the credits of all their productions, she was never credited as a designer of anything. She was, I think she was someone who was hired to engage in the actual physical uh, making of those things. But it is interesting to think about that scalloped edge, which is actually all the way around Big Mother and how it relates to a theater with, you know, um, the fabric and then this deep space behind it. Yeah. Next slide, please. So this is the verso of Big Mother and you can see this glow. Uh, it basically looks like a door, you know, this yeah. structure in the back. But is that, uh, I'm just looking at how the structure is on the back. Is that a canvas or is that also yeah. still a, a wood. wood or plywood? So it's interesting though that it has the cross bar supports uh, the way a canvas stretcher might. And actually this piece plus EKG are what started our dialogue in 2011, which by the way, sometimes feels like it was just like 10 minutes ago to me, but I realized it was a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, for, unfortunately for me, all all of time before March 2020 has now been collapsed into a single moment. Uh, there's That's only before before and after COVID. Huh. Don't you feel like that pause was this pause where we could all slow time down a little bit and reflect a little bit? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, those uh, of us who but are it, did, it did something okay. to the past beforehand that made it all one one huge period. It's interesting. And have you written poems about that? I wouldn't say necessarily about it, but uh, uh, well, that's why I have two uh, recent books. You know, the book uh, 
that's called um, feelings of and, of and is um, basically six years of work and it collects work that I wrote between, I think, 2014 and 2019. Uh, then in, uh, you know, from March 2020 to about November 2021, 18 months, I wrote as much work in poetry again as I had written in the previous six years. That was a product of, of that kind of lockdown situation. And so that's why a second book came out straight away after after the other one, which is in the newer one. Is called Water from Another Source, by the way. Barry, when you're writing your art criticism, does the cadence of your sentence, is it, um, do you look at it in the same way analytically you might when you're writing your poetry? I certainly think about it. Maybe I look at it a little bit uh, differently because it's a different kind of rhythm and uh, uh, you know, it has to be in a way much more self-evident, I think, in the uh, criticism. Uh, but yeah, of course I try and be, uh, take as much care with that. Although I don't always succeed because I've got deadlines and I don't know why nobody's giving me deadlines for poetry. <laughs> I can go on with them forever. I'm curious, um, do you ever find a phrase within your art writing that becomes the germ for a poem? It could, it could. I can't think of any uh, offhand. And uh, then there are things that I have to say that come from the art criticism that I just go on for years and years thinking should be uh, part of a poem. Uh, but I don't necessarily succeed in finding the poem that they should be part of. But maybe many, many years later, you pick it up. It could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things, things, you know, arise out of uh, who, who knows what the wells of of memory. It's interesting because for those Almond Brother fans out there, um, there's this great line where Dickie Betts had had a um, when he was a very young man, he met kind of a cowboy who said, "How are you doing?" And he said, um, trying to make it a living and doing the best I can. <laughs> you know, like the germ for yeah. one man, which became like this international hit. But it yeah. took me years until he picked up that line. He yeah. held it in his heart, in his head. Yeah. And probably was walking and thought of it from time to yeah. time. Sure, sure, sure. From Allman Brothers, back to Mario Dreyer. Um, next slide, please. Although everything's related to the Twain Allman for me. Um, um, so here we are with the another, deep... another tragic early death, by the way. Yeah. I mean, how much he accomplished in less than 25 years. Yeah. People don't even know what he accomplished because before the Allman brothers, he was a session musician. And if, you know, people realized all the like Aretha Franklin hits and so on that he supplied guitar lines for, they would be even even more uh, impressed than they already are. Well, Wilson Pickett's Hey Jude, I mean, that really kicked okay. off Southern rock. And it's that the, the session musicians had gone out for lunch and Dwayne Allman was with Wilson Pickett and said, let's do Hey Jude, which the Beatles had just done. So to do a cover of Hey Jude with Wilson Pickett and then rip it. Anyhow, yeah. um, we're looking at a detail on the left, which um, is this remarkable activity in the paint, this powderiness. And on the right, you see the contrast with the really flat orangey red paint. Next slide, please. Here's one that's at MoMA. Wow. Pleasure Principle 2 from 91. So this is getting towards the end of her short career. Look at the bottom, Barry. I mean, it's really interesting. She's got this kind of dark border and, then, you know, almost like it's held onto an easel by that front piece of an easel, you yeah. know, but it's painted yeah. into the painting. I mean, she seemed to bring physical objects into the painting whenever she could. Yeah. Next. Musical stand on the left. Yeah. yeah. 
This one's at Buffalo. It was used to be called the Albright Knox, now the AKG Gallery. Okay, not, not EKG, but AKG. Exactly, and by the way, if viewers have questions, please put them in the chat. And Maria, our brilliant uh, gallery manager here, will write them down and bring them to me. Next slide, please. Here's another one that's called The Rumor. It's mm -hmm. got that scalloped edge. This is in our show. It's interesting, these Barry, there's like the white underneath and then the red kind of, um, you know, agitated line going across. And then she does the green wash over the whole thing. Yeah. Next, please. Oh, there's a quote by a guy we know. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. I love this, you know, a scene through a misty pane of glass. You know, I'm sorry, but there are not many art writers who have this ability to create such a succinct poetic image in five words. So I would argue that one of the things I love most about your writing is that we're, you know, you're giving us this very accurate, heartfelt feeling of what it's like to see, to be there, and also recognition of the artistic process. And then it ends with this little click like that. And I would just say, you know, fabulous. I mean, is that something you hear from other people about the relation to your ability to do something so succinct and poetic? Well, thanks, James. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear about it more from more people. But, uh, <laughs> well, call me up anytime. You know, I'm, I'm always uh, happy for uh, for praise like everybody else. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, no, you don't, you don't, I mean, uh, people express appreciation, which I'm glad for, but they don't usually go into that much detail. Barry, what was the name of your collected um, essays that took that book? Oh, well, I mean, I have a few uh, collections of art critical essays. The last one is uh, uh, specifically a collection of uh, essays on painting, and it's called um, The Observer Effect. Uh, uh, I'm also, you know, I particularly like a, a previous one that is that collects a lot of the things I wrote for The Nation, and that's called The Perpetual Guest. Right. So these are books that I send to people as gifts. I love these books. And for those of you who haven't had a chance, they're kind of great to have laying on your bedside table and you just lift it up and flip through and find one and you engage in it. And if you're like me, you kind of search for these little clicks, like these little poetic clicks, like a misty pane of glass which might have been partly, I think we found that after we decided to put it with Laura de Santiana, who was literally creating incidents with misty panes of glass. Uh, next slide, please. Another edge from the rumor, next. I mean, how much glass light, how much more glass light could you be than that? Yeah, but then I love how the those uh, drips, from a little the little drips from the red onto the green are like lace hanging down from the right. Yeah, like cloth. It's amazing. Yeah, there's another late one that's in the Whitney gift of Elizabeth Murray, which is huh. very cool. Yeah, and so the border here is kind of you know this um, you know dot moving around. Mm -hmm. Now we really do feel a little bit like we're looking at a slide or some sort of something cellular. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think uh, they relate to paintings that Ross Bleckner was doing back then that had these cellular uh, kind of repeated uh, spots, uh, which, you know, then people related a lot to uh the AIDS epidemic you know which was ravaging our cultural life um you know. Ross Ross was um in addition to being really brilliant very self-deprecating and he said I look at some of these paintings like oh my god like how did she do that 
Uh, but I do see the relation with Ross's work here in a really interesting yeah. way. Yeah. Um, you know, Barry, you brought up a really important point about AIDS in the early 90s, late 80s. I mean, this was like a, um, a moment for those of us who were living through it. It was so tragic. Yeah. And you'd be walking down the street and you would see someone who you could tell had this skeletal thinness and was not long for the world. It was before there was... Um, uh, medication to help people who are many of them are still on the cocktail and still alive. Mm -hmm. Next paragraph. I'm uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, here we go. Fingerprint. This one you were talking about earlier, Barry. Yeah, although it's interesting. I mean, this one the the uh, title evokes the fingerprint, but there there are other ones where the the image of the fingerprint is much more evident. I'd like to mention this also. This, this is, is as if it's a kind of close-up of a, of a portion of the fingerprint right. somehow. We'll get to one of those. Um, this is in the Whitney's collection, Gift of Barbara and Eugene Schwartz. And as a young man, about 22, just out of college, uh, they invited me to their apartment on Park Avenue. And I'll never forget being there. It just left this huge impression. But one of the things was they had an Anselm Kiefer painting, which was too tall for their ceilings. And what they did is they had them, uh, somebody took the bottom portion off the stretcher and it went on the floor so they could have the painting in their home to live with it. I thought, yes, these are like really diehard collectors. They were epic. And it is interesting that the big collectors, the really brilliant collectors were collecting Moira's work in the day. Next, please. Here's another one. This is at the yeah. Carnegie. And it, you, when you look at the, the corners, you see these green squares, which I think is really fascinating. Next, please. Just uh, uh, relating to that fingerprint idea, it's funny, somebody was uh, discussing her with me the other day and the person said, well, do you think that that fingerprint idea is it somehow related to new image painting? And I said, huh, that's, I never thought of that. Um, but you remember new image painting in the kind of, late, I mean, Susan Rothenberg uh, in the late 70s and early 80s was considered to be part of that, Lois Lane and so on. And it was it was a, an idea about having a recognizable image within a, a kind of abstract context. Uh, and I don't think that that fingerprint idea of Moira's is exactly that because it's it, it isn't really an image it's just an implied image uh and it's it's existing on a much more of an, a purely abstract level and yet i think that's also though we didn't mention it before i think that's also part of the the background of the time that uh moira came up in that uh we shouldn't forget I think it's an interesting point. It's not one that I would think of. To me, what these um, fingerprints are about is uh, that all of us leave something behind. And uh, for those of us who know someone who has died, especially an artist, sometimes you see you know, the hair of a brush in the canvas. Sometimes you see a fingerprint in it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whenever I'm, you know, sick, I think, what would I be leaving behind? And it's interesting to think there would be fingerprints left behind as a trace of who I am. That's yeah. more how I think. So we have another painting here. This is the smallest in the group. It's 14 by 18 inches from 91. Um, and it's amazing how much depth there is in such a simple uh, motif as this. And this was included in Lily Siegel's show at the Reston Art Center, just outside of DC. Next, please. Just the Laura with it. And you see the detail on the right, how she got this kind of striation, which is so fascinating. It looks almost like a basket weave underneath this Harlequin pattern. Yeah. Next, please. So this is uh, the Phillips collection where you see NBC Nightly News. You see a couple of the paintings, um, the one on the far left, the green one, is owned by two great collectors uh, from the Aldrich, who are trustees at the Aldrich, uh, JK and Eric. 
Um, and then they had some memorabilia in the, the case. Next, please. Oh, you but can I, also- I think before you go ahead, I mean, I let's just back. point out because it's not, it hasn't been so obvious from some of the other slides that you've shown. Uh, this thing that I talked about early on about her play with the form of the rectangular tableau and how uh, you have a, a painting that has a metal, um, uh, a metal rectangle below it as if, as if it were uh, a, and it's like you'd have some kind of explanatory text on it or something. Of course, it had no text. Or you have this uh, oval green painting that then has some hardware sticking out from it, and then another piece that's held by the hardware. Or uh, in the background, you see a painting where the act, it, where it is a rectangle, but the bottom of it is curved outward. I mean, she she did all these kinds of things. Uh, differently in, in, in different paintings, but always with the same idea of the um, uh, playing around with the, the form. The orange painting, I should say, to me, reminds me of a record, an LP that's been cut in half and has an overlap, which again, is a little bit like a fingerprint. It's almost like someone's voice that is being interrupted. Uh -huh. I, I think interruption is a part of her work in a really interesting and again, for me, poetic way. Yes. Next slide, please. There's EKG in the stairwell and some other paintings, again at the Phillips. Next, please. This is at the Reston, Lily Siegel's second curated show. I mean, Barry, look at that off to the right, that kind of strange, almost like, uh, hieroglyph of a sun yeah but also with the empty center it is also like a record too like the other one you mentioned we do have one question here which is given the surfaces of her paintings are so fragile do they have a tendency to fade from my understanding uh Cassine does not fade but you have to be incredibly careful like we put them in shadow boxes travel crates so that they're suspended so that nothing touches the surface. And that was her, I mean, it's written on back of almost every painting, yeah. handled with white gloves. She was so aware of maintaining her legacy, which any artist would have. I think Casey is reputed to be very uh, color fast. Um, and although you can't trust to memory so much, I would say that when I saw these works, uh, again, in Washington, after not having seen them for so many years, they, they certainly didn't look different than what I remembered from, uh, from the late 80s and early 90s. Next slide, please. Again, at the Reston, I've got that Ross Blechner-ish cellular thing to the right. No. Next, please. Wow, I love that. They belong to a primal state next door to dream and memory. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I could see why you are so enamored of them, Barry, for a lot of reasons, but a next slide, please. Or maybe that is the last slide. I believe that might be the last. Yeah. You know, in relation, let's go back to that quote. Um, in relation to um, your own writing and Moira, I think sometimes uh, when I first read Bruce Chatwin in Patagonia, there'd be pages and pages where it's just moving on as description. And then suddenly there would be something, you're at a lake in Patagonia high up and he describes the blue and he describes a bird that's like jutting into the water and out. And it becomes this little, jewel of an emblem. It seems to me there's something in your own writing, which I find, and certainly in Moira's, we have another question. Um, do you see that relation, Barry? I don't know. I've, no, I've not actually read Chatwin. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but between your work and Moira's, this, this, this distillation, this distillation into something that becomes 
really big. You know, like you have these phrases, is what I always look for in your writing. Uh, maybe I'm the only person who does it, but I love that in your writing that you hit this point where, although you're moving through an artist's work, there's a poetic image that really sticks for me. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, you try and, uh, how can I say, T tell the reader what, what's there to be seen, you know, what the thing is. And in doing so, you try and give them some sense of what you found to be the feeling uh, communicated by that. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it has to come out in a, in a nuanced and subtle way. You can't hit them over the head with it or else it's somehow less, uh, less convincing. Exactly. Um, we have another question, which is how many years did she do her work? Um, really the earliest were uh, in the early 80s, the ones that we saw exhibited, and then, you know, really right until her death, so that, uh, you know, we have this absolutely staggering catalog, which David Moss um, had, had curated this show. Uh, these are works from 89 through 92. Um, for anyone interested in, you know, reading some great essays, I would highly recommend this book. Um, very, there's something that happens with a very short career. I mean, obviously, Egon Sheila, and we talked about Dwayne Allman, um, you know, um, Jean-Michel Basquiat. I, I was just uh, reading uh, Julian Bell's uh, new book on Adam Alzheimer. Let's not forget that uh, these meteor-like very short careers also go back to, uh, you know, the 17th century and before. Exactly. And you know, for that matter, Raphael, you know, an incredibly short career. We can only wonder what Moyer would have done, just as we only wonder with any of these artists. Um, it's a tight capsule, but isn't there the feeling that they're just, yeah, you alluded to this earlier, so much more would have been done if she were still alive and in her 60s. Um, there's a sense of tragedy that we didn't get to see the rest. You know, I think when you look at her work, it's a very cohesive, coherent, whole body of work that represents a certain number of years of effort. Uh, I think that inevitably uh, every artist who kind of becomes middle-aged goes through a period of uh, self-questioning and sometimes a kind of uh, crisis of uh, confidence. Um, and if they are able to overcome that, then their later work becomes even greater. Uh, and you see that with Matisse or so many others. Uh, we don't know really, you know, maybe, maybe she would have lost the thread uh, or maybe she would have lost it and found it and uh, come up with something even deeper and more beautiful. What we know is that we have something uh, that I think is just incontrovertibly uh, profound already. I agree. Well, I feel, unless there's something else you'd like to state, I think that's a good spot to close. I feel like we're treated to two poets today, you as an art writer and poet, and Moyer Dreyer as a painter and poet. Um, it's about, to me, the distillation of the image. For those of you who have not um, seen a Moira Dreyer painting, I would say rush to MoMA and see a masterpiece, NBC Nightly News. For those of you who have not read Barry's work, rush and read both his poetry and also his criticism. Barry, thank you very much for being here today. Thanks a lot, James. It's been a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.